Well, good afternoon. Thank you for being here. As you might recall, in my State of the State and budget address in January, I focus on two of the greatest challenges we face as a state, our demographic crisis and the economic inequity we see from county to county. As a reminder, today in Vermont, there are about 55,000 fewer people under the age of 45 and 44,000 more over the age of 65 than there were in the year 2000. For years, we had more deaths than births and have seen more people move out of Vermont than in. And the impact is not the same in every community. We have to acknowledge the real and growing economic disparity from region to region. Of the five towns that have seen the most growth in recent years, four of them are in Chittenden County. And in the past 12 years, only three counties have added workers. The other 11 have lost a total of about 18,000. And from county to county is a huge gap between home values, household income, average wage, and so much more. Because of this, across the state, we're feeling the negative impacts on everything, from our homes, schools, and colleges, to our hospitals and nursing homes. And to be honest, counties outside of northwestern Vermont feel forgotten. On Monday, I brought the entire cabinet to Essex County for capital for a day. Our first stop was two and a half hours from here in Beecher Falls, population 177. We were within sight of both New Hampshire and Canada. The largest employer in Beecher Falls is Ethan Allen Furniture with a little more than 100 employees, down from about 750 not too many years ago. Beecher Falls All Volunteer Fire Department covers 600 square miles in Vermont, New Hampshire, and Quebec. Their chief has served since 1973, and their deputy has served for over four decades, and he's also a retired VTrans employee. We learned that their budget for last year was about $85,000. So it's clear they do a lot with a little. And we heard stories of hard work and dedication all day as we traveled throughout the day. We heard time and time again, please don't forget about us. Please don't forget that wages are different here. Benefits are different here. Policies have different impacts here. Everything we experienced on Monday reinforce why my team is working so hard and why we're committed to an economic development strategy that expands growth and opportunity beyond northwestern Vermont. With that in mind, we built a balanced budget that doesn't raise taxes, but includes more than $15 million for economic development and benefits uh, that will uh, benefit every corner of the state. It includes more money for the Working Lands Enterprise Fund, an increase in the tourism marketing budget, the largest increase in the downtown and village center tax credits since the program was first created, a plan to complete the Lamoille Valley Rail Trail, which will be incredibly valuable to the economies of 18 towns in some of the most rural parts of the state and more. It also includes a proposal to uh, adopt, uh, adapt tax increment financing a tool used by larger urban areas like Burlington and South Burlington to successfully spark economic growth so it can be put to use in rural Vermont. The project-based tax increment financing tool will give downtowns and villages the power to complete much needed infrastructure projects, which then spurs a private investment, new housing, and new businesses. I want to thank the House and Senate Commerce Committees, uh, some of them coming in now, for working with us on this and for those members here with us today. I've also invited several uh, communities here today to tell you about the obstacles they face when trying to reverse decades of decline in their communities. And most importantly, to tell you how this new tool could help them overcome these challenges. The town of Westford will share their story, but you can also talk to Charlie Hancock, the select board chair from Montgomery. 
He can tell you about their 20-year effort to build a wastewater system in downtown Montgomery, which is needed to allow for more businesses and housing in their village center. Seth Jensen, a planning commissioner from Westford, can tell you about his community's work to redevelop their village core, also dependent on a wastewater system that's just out of reach of their town's financial grasp. Russ Bennett from Middlesex can talk about the transportation and streetscape improvements the town needs in order to spark more private investment <coughs> at near Camp Mead. Brian Story, the town administrator in Johnson, can tell you about the investments the town has made for a new industrial park that needs basic infrastructure in order to grow. And of course, you could ask Paul Costello and the Vermont Council on Rural Development about the dozens of communities they've worked with and the many priorities in need of funding. The project-based TIF proposal could help each of these communities. And the best part is, this approach doesn't require any new general fund dollars. The concept is pretty simple. It uses the increase in tax revenue for the new, from the new project to pay off the debt with revenue that would not exist without this new investment. For more than two <coughs> decades, we've allowed our larger communities to use this tool in complete transformative projects. It's time to provide the same advantage to our rural communities. It's only fair. And as we work to increase economic equity from county to county, this is a critical and crucial way to level the playing field. I've invited members of my team and the communities uh, that need this tool to tell you how it will work. I've also invited uh, Michael Gahn from the Vermont Bond Bank to discuss the issue of rural equity. With that, I'd like to turn it over to Secretary Curley. Thank you, Governor. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, as Governor Scott mentioned, our team has traveled around the state meeting with local and regional planning and development teams, housing leaders, local and county government, uh, legislators, employers and residents, many who are represented here today. These connections and the collaborations have enabled us to identify the barriers that are impeding our ability to create economic equity from Newport to Bennington. Dozens of small towns in Vermont, rural areas have done the work to identify what investments are needed to enable them to improve their downtowns, their housing stock, and to recruit and retain businesses those who will provide job opportunities that Vermonters want and deserve. We continue to hear about how our small towns, the backbone of our state, need new wastewater systems, new water systems, brownfields cleanups, and transportation enhancements. However, construction costs, steel, and labor don't cost less in a small town than they do in a large town. And there simply aren't enough taxpayers in a small town to float the costs of these wastewater systems, water systems, brownfields, and transportation enhancements. Unfortunately, too many of these basic infrastructure projects have been relegated to the shelves of planning offices, often because of failed bond votes or user fees that would make communities unaffordable or a lack of necessary local match to draw down the state and federal dollars. Other communities have been reluctant to take the planning on that they need to do to prepare for a catalytic infrastructure project because they know the math just does not pan out. The rural project-based economic development tax increment financing tool solves this equation, giving rural communities equity in their project by capturing future economic growth and tax growth to finance the project. I would now like to invite Megan Sullivan, Executive Director of the Vermont Economic Pro Progress Council, to share additional details on how this proposal aims to turn decades-old plans that could leverage economic development in our rural villages and downtowns into a reality. Megan. Thank you, Secretary Curley and Governor Scott. Uh, as you've heard from those who have spoken before me, many of Vermont's smaller and rural communities have a need to reinvigorate their village centers but face fiscal barriers to building the key infrastructure necessary to allow for new private development. While communities may be able to identify some funding sources, often the match requirements for these funds or the gap left to be filled by rate or taxpayers are out of reach. So many times, much-needed development and projects don't come to fruition. 
In this project-based economic development initiative, a community could identify a single eligible public improvement, such as wastewater system, brownfield remediation, redevelopment, or transportation enhancements, that would stimulate private development on specific parcels in their village center or their designated downtowns or a rural industrial park to finance with tax increment financing. Like in the current tax increment financing district program, a town would need to receive approval on the local level and then on the state level to participate in this program to ensure local support and verify viability. In this program, a town would incur debt one time for one project though, unlike the district program. The town would use the debt proceeds for a public infrastructure improvement. That improvement then allows for private sector development which increases the value of the property. The increased value generates new property tax revenue, which the town uses to repay the debt they incurred to make infrastructure improvements. At the end of the 20 year retention period, the full increase of the taxable values will go to the taxing authorities. As one senator said this morning, as I was discussing this in committee, this initiative could be a lifeline for our smaller rural communities. This small scale program will reduce the administrative burden for rural towns with limited staff capacity, but also give communities the opportunity to access this important tool and get the necessary projects over the finish line. Some of the towns here today will speak about their experience and their opportunity to this program could provide. I'd like to start that with Westford. So thank you for this opportunity to discuss Westford and rural needs for housing and economic development. Uh, my name is Seth Jensen. I am a member of the Westford Planning Commission. Um, and I'd like to begin by telling you a little bit, little bit about my hometown. Um, I grew up in Westford and graduated from the Westford Elementary School in the mid-1990s. Um, at that time, my class was the largest to graduate from the school in the school's history. Uh, so was the next class and the class after that. But then by the time I returned home in 2004, like many rural communities, the school population had begun to decline. Fewer young families were settling in town and older residents who could no longer maintain a rural home on rural acreage found few opportunities to downsize in the community. And while my class was the largest to graduate 10 years earlier, I can now count on one hand the number of my classmates who are returning home to set down roots and raise their own families. These trends were further exacerbated by the closing of the mobile home park in town due to its long failed septic system. Overnight, the town lost an entire neighborhood and while the Vermont Community Development Program softened the blow by assisting the families with relocation, our small town of 2,000 people was permanently changed. So rather than accepting that rural decline is inevitable, the town began to proactively search for solutions. Since then, the town has taken many steps to remove barriers to housing and economic development at the local level. Thanks to support from the Vermont Municipal Planning Grant Program, we developed and adopted a new form-based code that replaced an old outdated zoning uh, regulations with clearer, more predictable standards and a much more streamlined, straightforward process. Also thanks to the support from the Agency of Commerce and Community Development and the Agency of Natural Resources, we have secured village center designation uh, in our town center, as well as neighborhood area de designation for properties in our town center that front on Vermont Route 128, which is the state highway through the town. Uh, Westford was the first community with less than 2,500 people to achieve a neighborhood development area designation and remains the smallest uh, community with such a designation. However, despite these efforts on the local level, wastewater remains the key limitation to revitalizing our, our village. Westford's town center faces the same limitations as rural villages throughout Vermont that were built in the 1800s prior to septic rules and modern infrastructure. There are high water tables, thick clay soils, small lots, proximity to surface water, and well shields from private wells. We are now seeing both this work and these limitations play out in real time in our town center. 
The first test of our form-based code is currently underway as a local resident is in the process of building a new country store next to, this, next to the common, something that would not have been possible under traditional zoning. And while it is very exciting and rewarding to see uh, work trucks building a new building in our village, uh, the very limited capacity of the existing grandfather grandfathered wastewater system is preventing sit-down cafe at that building, as well as the occupation of two affordable dwelling units on the second floor. But, but for wastewater, our town and the state of Vermont would have two new apartments in the middle of our village. On a personal level, I want to say that this is more than just the loss of two apartments. These are the types of dwell dwelling units that would be ideal for the young residents that our town and the state of Vermont desperately needs to attract and maintain. Those are the young families, the people who I graduated from 20 years ago. Um, these, it's not only two apartments, it's two apartments above a cafe in walking distance of municipal facilities, schools, community spaces, natural resources, and recreational amenities. This is not just one unique, uniquely challenged lot. Across the common is the largest property in the town center, the former Pigeon Bus Garage. The property is within the designated village center and neighborhood development area and also adjoins our town offices and public libraries. While the town's form-based code would allow a lively mix of housing and commercial development, creating the main street that is found in many small villages, and the neighborhood development area would provide numerous incentives, including reduced state permitting fees and Act 250 exemptions. Here, too, wastewater remains the primary obstacle. The town has begun reaching out to both private and nonprofit housing developers, as well as small business investors, and the answer is all, always the same. Wastewater has to happen for this property to be revitalized. So while the town has taken numerous steps towards overcoming this challenge, including securing land uh, needed through a unique conservation purchase, um, receiving conceptual approval of a soil-based system from ANR, and now beginning the uh, process of the final design uh, to become eligible for clean water revolving loan funds. Um, every financial scenario we, we run shows a gap that needs to be filled in order for this project to be financially viable. Now, and unfortunately, of course, there's also the still matter, the, the small matter of building the system. Um, like most rural towns, we have a very limited grand list and a very limited population. Our only option to pay back the costs, especially if they are through a bonded loan, would be through user fees and local property taxes. So even with a substantial grant share, even with 50% grant, if those costs were borne by users, we would be looking at a user fee of at least $1,000 or more a year. Westford has a very limited supply of rental housing. Almost all of it is located in the town center. Again, this is very similar to many of our rural communities. More than half of renters in our town are already paying 30% or more of their income on housing costs, and nearly a third are what the census classifies as severely cost burdened, meaning that they are paying 50% or more of their income on housing costs. So we are in a situation without state support and another alternative to close this gap that we would need to make the small amount of existing affordable rental housing in our community unaffordable in order to create new affordable housing. This is a broken system, but it is the challenge that dozens, if not more, Vermont communities face throughout this state. The proposed project-based TIF legislation provides a way forward for towns like ours that cannot afford these types of investments on limited population and grand lists alone. It provides a path forward that is manageable for small communities that lack the staffing in larger cities by focusing on a single project and a handful of properties. It will allow us to create infrastructure needed for the housing and economic development that <coughs> simply will not and cannot happen otherwise. The, these new housing and job op opportunities will benefit not just our town but the entire state by providing much needed housing and services as well as in the long run growing the state grand list and state tax base. So I want to close with two final thoughts one from the national perspective and one that is deep, deeply local. 
There is a memo prepared by the United States Environmental Protection Agency that serves as the primary guidance document for water and wastewater preliminary engin engineering reports. It states that facilities proposed to be constructed to meet future growth needs should generally be supported by additional revenues. So the highest levels of government recognizes that systems designed to encourage economic development need revenue and funding beyond user fees and local property taxpayers. And finally, on a more local level, my mother has a letter dated May 11, 1991 from the Vermont Agency of Natural Resources to a member of the select board who happens to be my father. Following up on his request for a meeting to discuss the town's, quote, wastewater challenges. So we've made a lot of progress in the last 30 years. But if this could happen by local effort and local gumption alone, it would have happened by now. The project-based TIF will help us cross the finish line. We want to thank you for your time and support. And I would like to introduce Charlie Hancock from the town of Montgomery. Thank you, Seth. And thank you, Governor, for the opportunity. Um, I'll take any chance I can get to talk about Montgomery. Um, as the Governor pointed out in his opening remarks, this isn't something new for Montgomery. Um, 20 years ago, our community was battered by a flood, and in the, uh, in the aftermath of that, the community invested in an engineering study to see what a wastewater system would look like for the community. And the study was done, and it was put forward to the town, and the town saw one big important part of it, which was the price tag. And it was because of that price tag that study ended up in a on a shelf in our town office, and it sat there for 15, 20 years. Um, so we ambled along, we did what we could, and then in the past five years or so, we started to see growth in town. We've seen population growth, and population growth in young people, people in that 21 to mid-30s demographic with kids. And we've seen some business growth. We've seen small businesses pop up on Main Street. Um, and so the select board uh, stepped back and said, okay, how do we not screw this up, but how do we actually um, use this as a catalyst to, to launch Montgomery into the next century? And so we got together with Paul Costello's shop and had a community visit with the Vermont Council for Real Development and said to the community, what is it? What is it that's doing this? What do we need? And the answer we got back wasn't anything sexy or exciting. It was infrastructure. It was a public wastewater system and a revitalization of Main Street in the center to encourage more business development and also looking at the areas of affordable housing specifically for young people and for seniors. And so from that, we, we stepped back and we looked again at our infrastructure system and we saw that that growth we're seeing has a ceiling to it and that ceiling is the infrastructure ceiling. We've got a guy that wants to open a flatbread fired pizza shop in town that he's currently running out of a portable unit. He can't do that because his building doesn't have the wastewater capacity. We've got somebody who's looking at uh, one of the largest lots in our center to develop for affordable housing. He can't do that because there's no wastewater capacity. This isn't new too. I think people in this room are probably familiar with a company called Trout River Brewing. Well, when I first moved to Montgomery, one of the first stories I heard was that that company wanted to base themselves in Montgomery. That's where the Trout River is. But they didn't because there was no wastewater capacity. So this isn't a new story. So the town got together um, with a consulting firm, an engineering firm, and we just completed our preliminary engineering study um, to show us what will it look like to set this up in our village and our center, servicing not just the 165 existing parcels we've got there, but what it's going to do to serve the build out that we've projected. What is it, the growth that we want to keep going to attract young people, to attract businesses? Um, and so uh, we have that preliminary engineering almost finished. And again, the first thing that we looked at was the price tag. Um, and that price tag for this whole project came to what we think will be 12 to 14 million dollars. Now, as a selectman, that's the kind of number that makes my heart not skip a beat, but like stop. <laughs> um, and so, um, you know, luckily there's, there's resources out there. You know, we can go to USDA Rural Development, and luckily Montgomery's eligible for a 75% a um, grant portion of that, you know, which brings that down a lot. It brings it down to like two to three million, but two to three million is still the kind of number that makes a selectman's heart stop. Um, and those gaps, as Seth described, you know, without other tools like this project-based TIF, those are costs that are borne by our tax rolls. And, you know, we've got 1,200 people in town. Um, we're projected to have about 30% growth since 2010, but still, it's only about 1,200 people. Our grand list is like 1.6 million. So unless we need to look to that base to finance this total thing, um, it, it won't happen. And so these other tools that we've got, like the project-based TIF, are what's going to fill those gaps. 
gaps and make communities like Montgomery or Westford manage our debt in a way where we can still afford that new fire tanker that Montgomery needs, or we can still aff afford those other things that we need to look at for debt service. So it'll make those um, debt commitments manageable, and it'll also help us leverage greater resources. One of our goals at the Montgomery Select Board is how do we use other people's money? <laughs> and so this will draw that money into the community, which will in turn uh, leverage that development, catalyze that growth, grow the tax base, and launch Montgomery into the next century. So thank you, thank you, thank you for everybody who's supporting this and working on it. You know, this is a huge step towards rural equity and um, helping our rural communities really work themselves into the next century. So thank you. Um, with that, I'd like to uh, introduce Michael Gahn with the Vermont Bond Bank. Thank, thank you. you. I'll be quick. <laughs> Uh, thank you to the governor for inviting us to this event. Um, as executive director of the Bond Bank, I'm not necessarily here because of this specific policy, as that's ultimately in the hands of lawmakers, but because of the proposal's larger intent of fostering rural equity, which is one that we care uh, deeply about. Um, we view this through two lenses, one distributive and one financial. In the first definition, distributive equity means a fair shot for all residents at improving their community's well-being. In the second definition, financial equity, we're talking about a source of capital that results in ownership from day one in that community. In the governmental world, this typically means reserves, grants, loan forgiveness, or outside revenue sources to facilitate that financial equity. In both cases, a, municipal, a, excuse me, a municipality's ability, ability to find equity is critical to all of the bond bank borrowers as um, we're only as strong as our weakest link in many ways. And so the, portfolio, the health of our overall portfolio results in lower cost capital for all of our communities that we work with. Our expertise at the bond bank, as you might expect, is on the topic of financial equity. This is commonly discussed in the context of creating social infrastructure, but is often forgotten about when addressing physical or hard infrastructure development. The topic is likely overlooked because Vermont, like the country, has many programs and methods of providing debt financing for all types of municipalities. Um, however, what is missing in this past discussion of capital gaps is acknowledgement of debt capacity, as you just heard in the, in, uh, the Montgomery example. So, so what does this actually mean? Um, excuse me. Simply, uh, debt capacity. Thank you. <laughs> debt capacity is the maximum amount of debt that can be raised when considering payments that a community can afford. The resulting difference between the project costs and a sustainable level of debt is the capital capital gap that is best served by low or no cost equity. Part of the reason that this is overlooked in infrastructure development is that debt capacity at the municipal municipal level is one part hypothetical and one part comparative. The latter of these is where the bond bank has been able to make observations about the overall need for rural equity in Vermont. First, between 2013 and 2018, roughly 30 percent of towns had declining grand list valuations, meaning that the same dollar of debt service now comes along with a higher tax burden. Second, Vermont's ratios of debt to the grand list are below national medians. We're working to better understand the capital needs of our communities, and we're optimistic that this is a positive observation, but if we're honest, suspect that this more likely indicates underinvestment in infrastructure. Finally, we're first-hand participants in the difficult conversations occurring in small villages, which face the prospect of double-digit rate increases alongside multi-million dollar infrastructure projects. Fortunately, Vermont has the resources in addressing, in addressing the need for rural equity, not the least of which are the people of this room discussing this policy proposal. Um, thank you for the opportunity to lend our perspective on this important topic. Thank you, Michael. Uh, with that, I'd be happy to open it up to any questions. We do have other uh, communities in the, um, in the room, if you'd like to ask anybody else questions as well. Is a uh, project-based TIF in a small community, is there inherently a higher level of risk? than in a large community where there are a lot of factors involved in you know, how they can pay this off? I, I would say uh, that it's relative to the size of the community uh, and, uh, and some of the, the size of the, of the loans that are needed and, and the, uh, the, um, the revenue that's going to be received as a result. So I think it's relative to the community. But is there anybody else that would like to <laughs> weigh in on that? Sure, so similar to uh, the district program, um, an application would come to the state that would look at what is the viability of the program, what is of the project that's being proposed, and the private development um, that's coming. Um, part of the reason that we're looking at this as the gap funding is uh, because when we're looking at one project, one debt incurrence, as opposed to many projects over 10 years, um, 
there's an acknowledgement that the, the amount of increment is really to finance the gap and not to finance a whole project. Um, so the example that you have on the table and on these boards show how the financing for Westford would work, that they would be able to access grant funds um, and that their uh, rate payers would have to bear some of the cost as expected, um, but this would really cover that smaller gap and it's that the viability of how much um, that would be um, reviewed by the state. Yeah, if, if, God forbid, a project should be built, uh, the debt is accrued and the development doesn't happen, is the community on the hook for the gap? Yes, so any, if, the, if the private development doesn't come about, then the community is on the hook. Um, I think because, again, we're looking at, at one project, um, th that by the time they've come to the state approval, there's, there's a pretty um, good relationship already started. We, I think well, from what we've heard, their um, private developers may be interested, but because of the limitations of the public infrastructure, can't move forward. While these tax while these lower taxes are in effect, doesn't that uh, uh, hit the education fund? There would not be lower taxes in effect. The original taxable value would be frozen at the time that um, this is established, that the project-based TIF is established. And then a percentage of the increment would be added to that. So um, again, in the, the handout here, it shows that the original taxable value would be frozen for the, the time period of the retention period and 30% of the increment would go to the education fund. Um, the example of the 1991 letter, there hasn't been, if this could have happened locally to drive the, the addition to the grant list, it, it would have happened. Um, so this ensures that the education fund is getting their base value and a percentage of the increment. Doesn't freezing it keep tax revenue down for a few years because ordinarily it would go up a little bit? There's a 30% increment on top of the base value. What is the scope of the need across the state for projects like this? But we know there's a need of about four or five communities right here in the room. Um, maybe, Paul, do you have uh, any idea of uh, the, maybe the interest across the state and other communities? You've been around quite a bit. We've worked with, with 75 communities, and towns and cities around the state, Westford and, uh, and Montgomery included, who are struggling to look. You know, we think that the ground is a flat playing field out there, um, but you look at some of these towns that don't have municipal staff, they don't have uh, you know, an organization in the town, a town of 800 people. There's a heroic understanding and a heroic set of efforts going on in rural Vermont right now to look at how do we attract youth, how do we drive the future of our economy. No one can come with a top-down formula that rescues these communities. And we see towns like Westford and Montgomery all over the state that are stretching up and they're saying, what's within our power? And then what, what are the tools that are available? Thank goodness for the regional development corporations like Battleboro Development Credit Corporation, the RPCs, the Agency of Commerce, that help those communities that lack staff figure out ways forward. But it's all about local leadership. And these folks are trying very hard. This is another uh, really significant tool that could help lever these projects forward. I suspect there are 30, 40, 50 projects that are in consideration now. Um, I think it's sort of fundamental for the equity um, for rural Vermont communities in the future. So the total need is 30 to 50 million dollars? Well, it depends on the community, right? And the project um, as right. well. But do you have that number? Have you figured out what the need is? I have not. We do have it. What's the, what's the limit in terms of the capacity that would be made available? Well, certainly um, we, ha we, have to, we have to grow uh, slowly. Uh, I don't know if there's the capacity issue. Karen? Well, um, I think that what's going to be important is once there's a program in place, you'll find towns that have projects that are almost ready to go, but they haven't been able to move ahead at all. Mm -hmm. um, so that's why you don't know what the need is today. You're going to have to have something that's an incentive 
and actually allows projects to move before um, you'll see what the total need is. So how do you choose the projects? <coughs> how do you select which Well, projects? Megan had gone through that, uh, but uh, to fill in the gaps, uh, making sure that it's a viable project and meets all the requirements. All right. right, so there's an application process that would start at the local level to make sure that there's community buy-in um, in this project, that the community wants this. Um, and then that application would come to the state for review of things like cash flow and viability, look at the um, number of parcels that would be um, frozen. Um, this would be much smaller than the district program where you may have hundreds of parcels frozen. This would be a limited number, five to 10 parcels that would be funding the gap. What is the status of H-642 now? I believe there's activity in both the uh, House and the Senate. I, I would let uh, Randy or Charlie um, maybe speak to that. Or Mark, Mike, I'm sorry, I didn't see you. Uh, Randy. Well, H-642 uh, today was the first day that we took it up in detail in the Senate Committee on Economic Development, Housing, and General Affairs. And we're going to be working on it uh, uh, for the next several days and probably into the week following uh, town meeting week. Mike. Thanks, Governor. Um, my committee heard 642 this morning. Um, it was a first introduction to it. We had uh, conversations with many of the people that spoke here already. Um, we have, um, I have it planned on the agenda when we come back. Um, I think we're going to do all our, do our best to uh, get through the bill and get it across the hall to Ways and Means uh, so it meets crossover. So it's not a hit to the Ed Fund? Not as far as I'm concerned, because uh, you'd have to buy into the premise that these, would, these projects would happen without this help. And I would say they won't help. They won't uh, progress uh, unless we have some program like this. Any other questions on topic? So you say off topic? On. <laughs> <laughs> No, not yet. <laughs> so it's still not clear to me what the financial ask is. When, when this bill goes to House Ways and Means, what are they going to hear from you all about, you know, what the cost is? It's really about the mean? authority to do so, um, to, to make sure that we can uh, utilize this, uh, this tool that, you know, in the economic toolbox uh, to utilize in these smaller communities. Uh, and we've, uh, we've been able to expand uh, the number of TIFs uh, over the last uh, three years. Which I think has been beneficial for Vermont, but we need to make sure that we can uh, um, expand to the smaller uh, communities as well. Anything else that I missed on that? Is is there a concern with too many TIFs? I mean, the more you have, the more gross indebtedness there is around the state. Um, we have a proposal in the legislature that looks like it's going to go through, and I believe you support it, that would allow a TIF district to use proceeds, proceeds from the debt to pay down the debt, um, which puts you in danger of circling the drain. Um, is there a concern that there, there could be too many TIFs? I would love to have that problem here in the state. Um, that would mean there was a lot of economic activity going on uh, throughout the other uh, 12, 12 counties. Um, we'll, um, again, this isn't, I, I can't imagine uh, that this will be utilized by uh, such a great number that it would create that, uh, that uh, opportunity uh, for uh, some challenges um, from a financing standpoint. But, um, I think we can cross that bridge when it comes. Uh, this won't happen overnight. And uh, certainly, I, I believe this will be beneficial to the state. OK. This is when they start with the other questions. You're welcome to stay if you like. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thanks for coming in. And Charlie, I appreciate that comment about uh, using other people's money uh, to uh, we do that all the time here in the state house. Learn from the best, right? Yeah.
Sure, we have enough time for one, one and a half questions. <laughs> Uh, Representative Toll is experiencing some reserv significant reservations <coughs> about the quantity of uh, tax credits in your budget. She counts about $8 million worth. Um, she's wondering if we can afford all of that. Uh, is that a concern for you? Well, it wouldn't have been, if it had been a concern, we wouldn't have pushed, put the budget forward. Uh, obviously, uh, the budget is balanced. Uh, we accounted for all of that. Uh, we, uh, we had to make some changes within the administration in order to do that. Uh, I would remind everyone as well that we've, uh, we've seen some organic growth uh, in revenue over the last, uh, since last year, or another $40 million, I believe. So uh, there's some more capacity. It's about making choices and priorities. And I believe if we don't continue to invest in some of these areas, like these tax credits that I think are so important, uh, we're going to continue uh, to find ourselves in the position we find ourselves in today. And we need to, uh, to, to try and find a different path because what we're doing right now is just not working. And we need to, to move forward and trying to, to really focus on economic uh, activity in order to grow our way out of this. The demographics are real. Uh, the workforce sh shortages are real. And um, what we've been doing thus far hasn't, hasn't done anything to help that. So. Uh, we have to take a different approach, and I believe uh, the measures uh, that we put forward, as limited as they are, uh, are a step at least in the right direction. Uh, is, there, is there any work being done to try to convince skeptical members of budget every, writing committees? Every, every day. Every day. Would you, would you sign a, a tax and regulate marijuana bill if it includes the necessity to have a warrant for a saliva test? No, because I think what, what they've done uh, at this point in time is that they've, uh, the roadside testing doesn't exist under the bill that I've, uh, that I've seen on the floor today, um, providing for a warrant. Uh, even with a warrant, I think uh, it precludes anyone from any roadside test. It would have to be done somewhere else. Um, I just want to remind everyone, I mean, I was pretty clear in the, the three conditions I had to support this bill. Uh, and one of them uh, was roadside testing, a saliva test in particular. Um, I view this as the same as a breathalyzer. It's not evidentiary, um, but could be utilized to help those on the road, uh, those to help determine uh, whether there's any impairment due to not just uh, THC or pot, uh, but, uh, but uh, opioids or, or alcohol or, or THC or any combination of anything uh, of that nature to determine whether we need to bring a DRE in. So um, I think, uh, again, I've been clear um, that that would be what I would need uh, to, to support this bill. Um, but they've proven, obviously, this week uh, they don't need me. Uh, they can do, do this without me. But this is, uh, this is the condition I have uh, well, to have my support. Votes, so they do still need you. I don't know what it is today. That was yesterday. Uh, it could be quite different. And, and I would say uh, it's about the same, uh, same as what the uh, other vote was, and they were able to uh, convince eight, six, eight people uh, to change their votes. Is your problem with the warrant uh, civil liberties oriented, or that it's going to be taken at a later time in a different location? My concern is that they're not able to use this just like they would a breathalyzer right on the roadside to determine right then uh, whether there's an, an issue or not. Uh, it might preclude someone uh, who uh, is uh, maybe uh, suspected to be impaired. Uh, it, might, uh, it might clear them of that as well, and they could be on their way. Otherwise, they might have to spend three or four hours uh, at some facility uh, waiting for uh, some warrant. So you would, be, you would veto this in this current form? Um, I'm going to be very careful not to use the, the V word, uh, but, uh, <coughs> but I've been pretty clear about what it would take for me to support this. Well, I'd probably be so careful. I mean, because you because it, we, we don't even know, you know, I, I haven't seen whether it's passed uh, the House at this point. I know there's more amendments today um, as well. Uh, this isn't going to, uh, I don't, I can't imagine this will go over to the Senate and then they'll rubber stamp okay on this one. Uh, there'll be a conference committee and we'll, we'll see where it ends up. Uh, but, uh, but again, those three, three conditions uh, will exist throughout uh, the process from my standpoint. But again, they don't need me uh, to pass this. 
is the state doing anything more to prepare for the spread of the coronavirus? President Trump went on national television last night and spoke at length about it. Is there anything specifically done here in the state? We are, we are working every day on this and have been uh, for the last uh, few weeks. Our Department of Health, uh, with Dr. Levine at the, at the helm, has been a, doing a, a terrific job in trying to anticipate what this could mean to the state. Uh, we put together some contingency plans, uh, and we're just uh, planning for the worst, uh, but, but hoping uh, for the best. And uh, so we uh, want to monitor the situation. We have no known uh, confirmed cases in the state of Vermont at this point in time, um, but, uh, but we continue to, that we know that could change any day. Um, so we're continuing to monitor. We're just asking people to be vigilant and be aware of their surroundings, be aware of what's going on uh, with those that they may, uh, whom they may come in contact with uh, to make sure that we, uh, if there is a, a case, that we know about it and then we can uh, uh, prevent the spread uh, from there. But, but we, uh, this could change quickly, Does as we've seen. Does the state have an emergency preparedness plan? We do. We do. What is it? Um, we have, it's the same. The, it's the uh, plan that's uh, put in place for everything else. We're asking uh, every department to review uh, their their plan, and uh, we're staying in uh, daily contact with the CDC, uh, as well as with uh, with the uh, human services, uh, federal human services as well. So we feel as though we're staying on top of this, uh, but um, you know it could change again any day. How do you prepare people? <clears throat> Oh, uh, that's might be up to you, um, as much as anything else. Um, we're doing our best uh, to say we want to be realistic about this uh, as well. We don't have any cases in Vermont at this point in time, uh, but uh, there are many people traveling, uh, coming back, coming in contact with someone else. We just need to communicate and make sure we know about this and take the proper uh, precautions. Treat this like the flu. Uh, at this point in time, uh, in prevention of getting the flu, uh, trying to, to make sure you don't come in contact with someone who might be sick or has been traveling and come back. Uh, make sure you wash your hands uh, multiple times a day, uh, as well as coughing, sneezing, and so forth. Do that in your, in your sleeve or in your, uh, in your shoulder. Take all those same precautions, and if you're sick, stay home. Are you aware of the state, if any of the hospitals in the state have the uh, capacity to test for this virus? I, you know, I don't. Um, I don't know that. Um, I know there's a limited number uh, of uh, facilities across the country that can test, but I don't know who they are. Where, where's the nurse lab, do you know? I just don't know. I can get that for you, though. On another topic, can you tell us why Emily Bodecker left her administration? She, uh, she, this was a conversation uh, she had with the secretary. I don't know all the details, but she uh, resigned to pursue other opportunities. What do you know? Is it pretty unusual to have someone resign uh, back immediately? Uh, yeah, yeah, I mean, I, I just don't know the details of it. Um, but, uh, but she was great uh, in, in terms of she's a great, great person. I uh, wish her the very best, and she did uh, a lot of uh, good work for us. Tell us about your discussion with Mr. Weld today. Um, just met with him uh, briefly, uh, just a little bit earlier, and um, just stopped in to, he stopped in to thank me uh, for my public support. Um, and I just asked him how things were going and his reception here uh, at the State House. He said it was very respectful. And I appreciate that uh, from members of uh, both sides of the aisle uh, in terms of they might have different views on who they would support. Uh, but they, they treated him well while he was here. Is public support different from an endorsement? No, I don't think so. Okay, no, right. no, it's the same. Okay, yeah. I wasn't sure if that was Yeah, no, I... So you have, you have endorsed? Yes, yeah. I'm, when, I, when I vote for somebody, that's like an endorsement as far as I'm concerned. Got it, thank you. Did, was there a photo op? Um, no. No. It was, we were told it was closed to the press, and if you're well, publicly it was, supporting him, then why was it closed? Well, it was just a five to ten minute conversation, more personal than anything else. I've, I've met with him before, uh, but he wanted to check in on his, uh, on his way out to his next, uh, next stop, um, and I'm not really sure where that is, to be honest with you. But, uh, uh, but it was just really a, more of a personal check in, and he just wanted to thank me uh, for publicly doing what I did. What, so not that, not that you were you were concerned about photos of you and Bill Wells. No, no, not as far as I'm concerned. I think he's a decent person, decent human being. 
very uh, <laughs> person. Well, I, listen, listen. No, no, no. I listen. I, I, considering I, I've said uh, all I'm going to say about uh, the alternative at this point. Uh, but I am. Uh, I think he uh, he served his state well as governor. Um, very, very popular in the state of Massachusetts uh, as a Republican. Uh, had uh, high favorability ratings in the 70s. Uh, and as well, um, he was a U.S. attorney. I mean, he's, he's well respected across the field. And, and I, I just think uh, he's a, a great choice. Was there a hint that the alternative is not a <laughs> I've, I've read some of those uh, <laughs> comments, but I don't believe that to be the case. Um, do you have any concerns for election security in terms of, um, you know, influence on the votes? Uh, and which, what election? Uh, uh, primaries. In the primaries? Not that I'm aware of. The Secretary of State uh, seems to think everything's well in hand. So I, I have no reason to believe that there's going to be a problem in Vermont. Secretary of State this morning talked a lot about misinformation campaigns and how they can be that's that's been that's like over the last 200 years, but sure. Uh, Specifically through, through social media and the ability for the for that uh, just spread yeah. like wildfires. What, what would you like to say to people with polls? Stay know, off social media. <laughs> you know, don't believe everything you read, other than what are these folks in this room. <laughs> what do you think of uh, the Act 250 reform is coming out of the House seemingly um, without the statewide commission? Uh, is that a deal breaker for you? I wouldn't say that in itself is a deal breaker, but uh, there are some other provisions uh, in that bill. Uh, it's got a long ways to go, uh, obviously, uh, but there's some other provisions in the bill uh, that uh, that I would think um, would be problematic. Uh, one of those going, uh, changing uh, the elevation, uh, for instance, of, uh, of what would uh, determine an Act 250 permit, and it's gone uh, from 2,500 feet uh, today, elevation 2,500 feet, uh, and last I heard, it was at 2,000 feet. Now, that doesn't sound like a lot, uh, 500 feet, uh, but that accounts for about 500,000 acres. Uh, that also accounts for, uh, I think, over 4,000 structures. So think about this. You have a, a camp or a home uh, in that, uh, that you've had uh, for uh, decades, and then all of a sudden, uh, this provision comes into place, and you, uh, if you want to uh, redo your driveway, you want to redo your home, you want to do whatever, uh, you're going to have to get an Act 250 permit to do it. So that that one, uh, as well as some other uh, other areas that uh, that I believe are problematic. I wanted to ask. Just we're about to hit the All Star break here. Um, uh, your, your impressions of the session so far? Um, you, you know, it's been. Uh, I think it's been it's been challenging uh, from a number of different perspectives, and I think uh, the national perspective uh, changes even the dynamics in this building. And um, I'm just concerned uh, about uh, many are losing sight of the fact that uh, we have some real challenges here in the state uh, that we should be focusing on more of the economic uh, tools that are needed and incentives uh, to progress and work our way out of the challenges we face every single day. You heard it here today. Uh, I'm sure if you'd heard uh, other uh, communities come forward uh, that uh, they would have told you similar stories. Uh, and we saw it, really, uh, firsthand uh, when we went to Essex County. And you think about Essex County and, uh, and Lunenburg uh, being uh, the highest populated uh, town in uh, Essex County, and I think it's uh, like 22 or 2,300 people. Um, so. It, it really it reinforces everything that we've been working on, everything that we've been seeing and hearing, uh, and this is replicated uh, throughout the state. A uh, 40 percent uh, reduction in the number of students uh, over the last uh, couple of decades. I mean, this is they're seeing it, they're feeling it, and uh, they want some some help. Uh, they like uh, their uh, their privacy, uh, but at the same time, uh, they're looking for some economic uh, vitality. These, these problems in rural areas and small towns are happening all over the country. In many states, actually, are getting worse. And are you checking to see what, what maybe uh, other states are doing that, that's working and that isn't working? Well, yeah, we're always uh, trying to glean any information, anything, uh, any ideas that other uh, uh, states are, are having uh, success with. 
I think we can look at Maine. Uh, Maine's uh, doing some a few good things. Uh, in fact, uh, their their tourism dollars have have increased by about um, two or three fold over the last few years because they tied uh, they tied some incremental uh, approach uh, to boosting uh, their tourism dollars, marketing dollars. Uh, so there are a lot of things uh, that uh, many others are doing, uh, but. Just because it's happening in other uh, states doesn't mean we have to accept it. We're too good a state, and we have too much to offer. We have a lot of uh, great assets we could leverage, and uh, we just have to make it affordable for people to both stay here and come here and give them a few incentives to do so. And, uh, and I think we have uh, a few ideas of our own uh, that we put forth. I hope, uh, I hope the legislature spends as much time uh, on those initiatives as they did their own initiatives in the first half. And, uh, and then we'll see what happens. But, uh, but I still, you know, again, we're at the, uh, almost at the halftime break, uh, and uh, we'll, we'll see what happens in the second half. So too much time on things like paid leave and cannabis and... Well, uh, again, I mean, I, those are real issues, uh, and they have a lot of interest from uh, many, uh, many constituents, uh, but we're getting through those. So, uh, you know, check those uh, boxes. But let's, uh, let's focus on the things that will bring us in uh, more revenue so we don't have to have all these difficult conversations about where are we going to cut? Uh, how are we going to fulfill the needs of uh, Vermonters uh, by, uh, and, and living with our means at the same time? I mean, think about, again, our underfunded liabilities. Uh, we're, the mortgage payment on that this year is going to be $199 million, up about seven million uh, from last year and that's going to continue to grow so those are the real issues uh, that we have to face and figure out what how are we going to pay for these because um, it's not as though uh, there's an endless amount of money uh, that's available you said that uh, national politics is having some effect on dynamics in this building do you see more partisanship or more contention well you know i yeah I, i'd say uh, it, it's a ripple effect uh, across the country when you hear all kinds of things happening, the polarization is happening throughout our country, um, it's bound to affect us in some way. I'm doing my very best to make sure that we're uh, treating each other with respect and civility, um, but in listening to different ideas and different approaches, um, but at the same time, um, it's, uh, it, it's, it's part of Vermont uh, to, to work together. I think it's part of our our culture and our heritage, and, 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 and I'm not seeing that we have as much, uh, we haven't seen as much of that in the first half, but we'll see what happens. Do you think uh, school spending will be an issue after town meeting results, <coughs> as it has been in past years? It should. Um, I mean, we're spending, uh, again, we've tipped, we've tipped that, uh, that $1.8 billion dollar, uh, uh, perspective uh, of, of uh, uh, that, uh, that $1.8 million dollar uh, threshold uh, at this point in time, and uh, that's up 87 million dollars over last year projected spending. Meanwhile, the student count continues to to uh, deteriorate. So um, there's another area where we need some we need to get realistic about what what we're doing and how do we deliver it in a much better way, much more efficient way. Uh, going back to uh, to uh, Essex County, uh, Beecher Falls, Canaan. Um, it was interesting uh, because we were there, and the uh, community uh, is going through uh, the, the, the work of trying to work with New Hampshire on a new uh, school or a different school under one roof, uh, working with uh, Pittsburgh, uh, Colebrook, and Canaan, uh, working a, a across the lines to develop one school. Um, so it's an interesting uh, concept, uh, but they're facing some of those uh, nostalgic uh, t types of challenges like sports, uh, you know, who, who, uh, where you went to school and, and are you going to give that up and, and so forth. So, um, but but they're, they're trying to do something of, about this, uh, uh, this education dilemma we, we are facing right now. Team with six mascots. Yeah, and not enough players. <laughs> <laughs> uh, is, it, are, aside from the economic development initiatives, are there other, other issues you think really need to be hit hard uh, in the second half? Well, that would be where I'd like to see us put uh, most of our effort, uh, but um, take a look at my budget address and come up with the rest of them. Governor, um, would you support H-808 
and Donahue's proposal to address the deadly force issue that we talked about last week. It, it would basically provide us with a California level standard for deadly force. Is that something you support? Um, I don't know where it's at uh, in terms of uh, it's obviously must be still in committee, or is it out of committee at this point? Uh, do you uh, know? It's, it's still in committee, I, but in principle, would you support it? The yeah, I, again, it sets a, a statewide standard. I, I think we, we we can do better than what we're doing today, and we're uh, as a, um, as administration, uh, we're always willing to to find better ways uh, to to deal uh, with some of these situations. And as I said last week, we're we're willing to have the conversation. I don't know about the, the bill and, and that one in particular. I haven't read it myself. Mm -hmm. uh, but um, but we're willing to work together uh, to come to a, a place where uh, people are safe um, well, and not overused. basically says the force is only justified if it's necessary and if a threat is imminent. So it yeah. sets a new standard. I, I, and I'm, I'm not sure. I'm sure. Uh, there's some lawyers in the room uh, that might uh, be able to tell us what necessary means uh, unless and, and those words matter and and what how do you determine that uh, out in the field and and I think that's that's the question I mean how do, you can you can come up with all kinds of uh, different uh, different requirements but I think it comes down to mostly I think it comes down to training uh, and how to deal with uh, with people uh, in in those situations and and that's where it starts. But, but there wasn't a single police officer who was dinged in any way as a result of investigations by the AG's office over a period of 50 years, we found in our study. Is that right? I mean, uh, I, if, it, if I have to assume that it's right if that's what the, the results were, but. I mean, is it okay that no one's ever been charged for homicide or? Malpractice of any kind. Yes. Yeah. Again, I would have to. If it happened over 50 oh. years, it had to be over multiple attorney generals uh, at the time who determined this, right? So it's, it's okay that they're always justified. These. It's it's never okay to take a, another life, um, but uh, sometimes it is justified. I'm I'm not. I'm just saying that there may be different ways to deal with this with training, uh, and maybe uh, maybe this bill would help. We're always willing to learn uh, how to do things differently than we're doing today to prevent this from happening. So we don't have to have uh, the investigation, possibility of charges against uh, those who are trying to protect us. And so you're, what you're saying is it shouldn't always be justified, even though over the past 50 years, it's always been justified. I don't think that's what I'm saying. I'm just <laughs> saying uh, that obviously someone has found them to be justified, not me. Uh, mm -hmm. They never asked me in any of those cases. Uh, but over multiple attorney generals, uh, they have found that they've been justified. So I have to take that at, uh, at some value. So does that mean we need to change the standard? I think it needs to, I think it means we need to do uh, a better job in training in a different way uh, to prevent this from happening in the future. Okay. Thanks. Governor, um, in your budget address, you pitched uh, tax breaks for military pensions um, and uh, retirement people from the armed services. For the fourth straight year, yes. Yeah, for the fourth straight year. So I, what's holding it up? Uh, the legislature. <laughs> Specifically, though, I mean, can you speak to sort of I don't, no, I, I, I think, I don't know if it's a, yeah, it's not, I wouldn't say it's a partisan issue. Um, but it, I'm not, I don't know if uh, they've been convinced that this could actually help us economically as well. If we can have more of those retirees come back home that have left Vermont after a career in the military and want to come back home but are prevented or don't come back because we tax their pensions. Uh, that's, uh, and when we have a workforce shortage, it just doesn't make any sense to me. Uh, I believe this would be revenue neutral. I don't believe it's uh, eliminating anything. I think if we can put, uh, bring back more people, and put them to work, uh, we'll recoup, the, recoup those uh, costs uh, associated with this so-called um, um, tax uh, dilemma. What are your thoughts on the Green New Deal that was introduced in the Senate? I, I'm, they, they had, uh, I don't know what they're doing with it, to tell you the truth. I don't know if it's going to make crossover or not. Um, obviously, they, I mean, they had other priorities if it doesn't. So I, I think it's a better question for them. Okay. 
All right. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.